Heavenly Father, we want to bless your name this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come together before the throne of grace. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have purchased the freedom that we desire, that we need to live a victorious life. Lord, we pray that as we listen to your word this morning, that you will prepare our heart, O oh Lord, that the ancient words that have been preserved for us, Lord, I pray, let it penetrate into our soul, into our spirit. Let it give us the wisdom, the freedom, the power that we need to walk with you, to be victorious. Lord, we pray that the powers of darkness will not gainsay your word in our lives in Jesus' name. Lord, we have come with an open heart. We want you to impart your words into our soul. We want to understand your word. We want your word to set us free. We want your word to guide us and make a map for us until we see you face to face in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for the answer. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, this morning, as has been said, we're looking at the topic saved, separated, and sanctified. Salvation, separation, and sanctification. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I read from verse 14. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part had he that believed with an infidel? And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Wherefore, this is the commandment of the Lord, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. Almighty. God is here talking to us as the members of the church that he wants to be a father unto us. He wants to be our God. He wants us to be his own people. He wants to dwell in us. He wants us to be able to call him God and he to call us his own people. But there must be a separation there must be a distinction between the people of God and the people of the devil. And that is why it starts in verse 14 that there are two opposing kingdoms. There are two opposing worlds. You have the world of the unbelievers and the world of the believers. You have the world of the righteous you have the word of the unrighteous. They have the word of the light and the word of darkness. We have Christ as opposed to Belial or Satan. We have the temple of God and we have idols. And these two kingdoms are diametrically opposed to one another. You cannot be in the two kingdoms at the same time. And you cannot shuttle between one kingdom 
and the other. It is either you are in the kingdom of light or you are in the kingdom of darkness. Look at what Jesus Christ says in John chapter 18. John chapter 18 verse 36. He says, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. And you will have heard as a believer many times that we are not of this world. Because the kingdom of our God, the kingdom of Christ is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? You know, sometimes we wonder, why is God not intervening physically in the affairs of his people? He says here, he was before Pilate, and Pilate was surprised. You say you are a king, and now you are under arrest. Now you are supposed to be crucified. Your own people have delivered you to be crucified. And you say you are a king. Where are your subjects? Where are your servants? A king is supposed to have an army. And how can you be arresting the king of a kingdom and the armies are not fighting? If somebody was to go to Canberra now, I want to arrest the prime minister. I want to do some evil to him. Of course, the armies of this nation will fight. But Jesus Christ was telling him, he said, look, if my kingdom was of this world, then my servants will fight. It's not because I don't have servants. It's not because they are powerless, they cannot fight. But my kingdom is not of this world. So you must realize as a child of God, our kingdom, the kingdom of Christ is not of this world. It is a different kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom for now, but it's going to be a physical kingdom in the world to come. But the question is, are you in this kingdom? You cannot afford to be in doubt whether you are in the kingdom or not. If you are in doubt, probably you are not. You must be sure whether you belong to the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. My prayer is that this morning, the Lord will open your understanding. If you are not yet in the kingdom, you will press in into the kingdom. And if you are in the kingdom, you will have a realization of what it means to be in the kingdom. What it means to be in the kingdom, but in this world. Not being of the world, but in the world. The Lord will give us understanding in Jesus' name. I look at three points before we pray. Number one, saved from the wrath to come. Point number one, saved from the wrath to come. Number two, separated from worldly pollutions. And number three, sanctified holy unto the Lord. Point number one is saved from the wrath to come. Many times you hear the word salvation. Salvation. You must be saved. You must have salvation. But saved from what? Salvation from what? Why do you need to be saved? Why do you need to be rescued? You know, somebody who is safe doesn't need to be rescued. Somebody who is already saved doesn't need somebody to save him. So when we're talking about salvation and being saved, we are talking about salvation from the wrath that is to come. Look at Romans chapter 1. There is a wrath. There is a judgment. There is a punishment that is awaiting this world. Look at it as if there's a whole head that is going to destruction. Going, rushing madly. You remember when Jesus Christ gave leave to that, those legion? And they said, we are a legion because we are many. 
And they gave them leave. And they entered into the swine. And the Bible says thousands of them. They rushed madly into their destruction. All of them perished. And the villagers were so much afraid. They said, Jesus Christ, please can you leave our village? That is how the world is. A mad rush to destruction. A mad rush to hell. And that is why there is need for salvation. When we talk about the gospel, we say the gospel is good news. Why do we need a good news? Because there is bad news. And the bad news is because the world is on a mad rush. Satan is rushing them. Just like those demons, they entered into those swine. Those swine were innocent. You can imagine, you know, you, you feel sorry for them. But it is because all those demons, they always want a body to dwell. And the same thing, the Bible says the God of this world, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. And they are on a mad rush to hell. That is why they need salvation. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I want you to look at yourself this morning. The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness. If there's any ungodliness in your life, the wrath of God is revealed against you. If there's unrighteousness in your life, the wrath of God is revealed against you. There is a judgment that is to come. Why? Because... The wrath of God is the punishment of God. You know, the society we live in today, they say everybody is basically good. Let everybody live the way they want. You know, everybody has a right to do whatever they, look, they want to do, to, to live the way. Why, why, should you, why should you prescribe life to other people? Let them live the way they want. But where there is liberty, there is responsibility. Every human being is on a probation. The Bible says we shall all stand before the judgment of the Lord. So we see in Romans chapter 5, how do we escape this wrath that is to come? Romans chapter 5, verse 9. It says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. The only way you can escape the wrath that is to come on this world is to be justified by the blood of Christ. What does it mean? You know, somebody says justified means just as if you have never sinned. When the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses your heart, cleanses your life, forgives your sin, God looks at you as if you have never sinned. And therefore, the wrath of God. So, when we talk about salvation, is salvation from the wrath that is to come. You know, in John, 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, just as we have read in our text of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, John the beloved here, he was identifying those two categories of people. Those that are in the kingdom of the devil and those that are in the kingdom of Christ. 1 John chapter 3 verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy 
the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. What is the distinguishing mark between the children of God and the children of the devil? S-I-N. You know, I like the way they teach the children. They said, S-I-N is Satan identification number. It's a pin. That's the pin number. You know, when you have a pin number, you can access a particular enclave. Could be your account, could be, you know, a software or anything. So what is that distinguishing mark that separates the kingdom of darkness, the children of light, the children of the devil from the children of God? It is S-I-N, sin. It's not going to church, it's not fasting, it's not a dressing, it's not anything. It is this particular three-letter word, whether it's in your life or not. And when Christ comes into you, you have the Christ identification number. That will be your number in Jesus' name. God cannot overlook sin. God cannot overlook sin. It is either it is forgiven or it is punished. It cannot overlook sin. If you get that into your mind, if you get that into your psyche, if you are an unbeliever, if there's still sin in your life, it makes you to realize you need to do something. What do you do? Salvation is to escape from the judgment and the wrath to come. Look at what John the Baptist told the people that came to his preaching. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? This is the warning. God is warning you. Flee from the wrath to come. When he saw a lot of those Pharisees coming to his preaching, he said, what are you doing? Who, is, who, has, who has warned you? Because they knew that there was a wrath that is going to come, and therefore they were running. But he said, don't just run. There's something you need to do. Verse number 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruit need for repentance. To flee from the wrath to come, you need to repent of your sin. Bring forth the fruits of repentance. Don't just say, I've repented of my sin, but your old ways of sinfulness is still in your life. No, that's not bringing forth the fruit of repentance. And there is no excuses. Think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham to our father, and so what? For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. I was born in deeper life. That's, it doesn't mean you are born again. My father is a pastor. Oh, we, we knew when this church was started. You know, we have been in the church since day one. Say not, we have Abraham to your, fa to, to your father. The question is, are you saved? Have you repented of your sin? Have you brought forth fruits that are made for repentance? Look at John chapter 3 in verse 36. John chapter 3 verse 36. He that believeth on the Son had everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath, the wrath of God abided on him. My prayer is that the wrath of God will not abide on you in Jesus' name. And at the final judgment, 
God will separate those for whom Christ bore their wrath from those that will bear it themselves. If Christ has not borne your wrath, you will have to bear it yourself. That's the difference for, between those whose Christ has borne their wrath because they have believed on him. Because the blood of Jesus Christ has justified them. And in saving us from his own wrath, God has done what we could not do. And he has given us what we do not deserve. Imagine, God provided a way to save us from his own wrath by putting that wrath on the Lord Jesus Christ. So our sin must be put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is calling you this morning. Do not say, we have Abraham to our father. Do not bring any excuses. You must be sure, are you saved? Are you really, really saved? If you are not sure, my prayers are this morning, you will go on your knees and the Lord will give you that salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number two, separation from worldly pollutions. Separation from worldly pollutions. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 14. It says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part had he that believed with an infidel? See, there's just a clear line of demarcation. And that is God. That is what God wants for us. You know, the world today, we are bombarded with a lot of temptations. And God wants us to keep that line of demarcation between the church and the world. Between the world and the church. Satan is always trying to blow that line of demarcation by his subtlety. He wants to infiltrate the church. And if you look at a lot of denominations today, and you go to their history, how the founding fathers, they brought those churches together. They stood on the word of God. And compared to what they are today, what is the reason for their demise is because that line has been blurred between the world and the church. You know, in the attempt to make Christianity more popular, let's make it more popular. Let's not talk about sin. Let's not just, let's not emphasize sin because it's not popular. It's not getting popular. They make it less offensive. You know, if you talk about sin too much, you offend many people and therefore they become silent. And that is what has destroyed those churches. It will not destroy our church in Jesus' name. They make it more palatable. Palatable to sinners. You know, many people come here and maybe first week, second week, third week, by the time they begin to hear the word of God and it shakes them, just like Felix. Felix had the word of judgment. He trembles. He said, I don't want to hear this now. And they run away. Does that mean we change the message? No. We cannot make it palatable by compromising. They want to make it less narrow. Jesus Christ said, narrow is the way that leads to life. And you cannot widen it. Just because you want more people to go there, you'll be taking them to hell. It must remain narrow because it cannot take people and their sin and baggages. And it must remain exclusive. Look at what God says in Verse 17, it says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye what? Separate. See, God has always been interested in his people being separate, being exclusive, 
been distinct. If you look at Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah chapter 52, this is in the Old Testament, verse 11. It says, Depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. Now, what vessels was he talking about here? These are just physical vessels. The priests, you know, they will handle the basins. They will handle the altar that was used for sacrifice in the tabernacle. And because they handle those physical things, they cannot handle sin. He said, go out from the midst of her. Depart you from iniquity because you handle the physical vessels of the house of God. How much more you that have Christ living inside you. He said, touch no unclean thing. What is that unclean thing? It is sin. And I will receive you. We are the temple of the living God. Look at Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20 in verse 24. It says, But I have said unto you, Ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. It's not a matter of discrimination. No. It's because God wants a distinct people that will show forth his glory. All the surrounding nations were idol worshippers. And God wanted them to be separated from those idolatrous nations. He says, I have separated you. Because I want you to show forth my glory. The church cannot be an effective lighthouse for Christ. We cannot be an effective lighthouse for the truth when we entrap ourselves with worldliness. We are to separate ourselves from worldly attitudes and habits and lifestyle. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, in verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. And we are not of the world. You know, people, unfortunately, in some of our societies, the pride of life, they want to celebrate, you know, birthday. There's no, there's no harm in it. You want to dedicate something. There's no harm in it. They say, we want to give glory to God. We want to thank God. We want to give thanksgiving unto God. But the motive is a show off. They just want to show off who they are, what they have. And that is of the world. It's not for believers. The pride of life. So Paul was writing to the Corinthian church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, we are the temple of the living God. There is no fellowship between righteousness and unrighteousness. There is no communion between light and darkness. There is no concord between Christ and Belial or Satan. There is no partnership between a believer and an unbeliever. And there is no agreement between the temple of God and idols. But the Corinthian church, because of the influence of idolatry, pagan worship, immoral culture, and the false teachers, they were in danger of moving back into the kingdom of darkness. And that is why the warning came that they must be separate. You know, one of the subtle strategies of Satan is for the church to tolerate sin. For you to overlook sin. 
No talk about it. Just be here with the people. They are weak. It's a society in which we live in. How are they going to behave themselves? Sin is everywhere. But that is the doctrine of the devil. If you look at Revelations chapter 2, that is the strategy of the devil. He wants you to tolerate worldliness. Tolerate sin in your life. Because that is the way to suck you back into your old way of life. Revelation chapter 2. Look at the church in Pergamos. Revelation 2.14. It says here, but I have, let me read from verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, this thing said he which had the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days where Antipas was my faithful Mattia, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. See, this church was actually placed in a place where Satan's headquarters was. Say, this is where Satan's seat is. I know that you are faithful, even though you are living in the headquarters of Satan. And there was even someone that was faithful. He was killed, but he stood his ground against Satan. But do you know, there was another way, just like Balaam. Balaam couldn't curse the people of Israel. So he counseled Balaam. Say, do you know what to do? Just infiltrate their ranks with these daughters of Moab. Let them begin to entice the people of Israel. And that is the strategy of the devil. Look at verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them which hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Look at this church. They could stand against Satan directly, but indirectly, Satan allowed. I mean, they allowed Satan to introduce that doctrine, Balaamic doctrine, introduce the daughters of Moab. Look at, look at Numbers chapter 25, where it happened. Look at what happened. Numbers chapter 25. In verse 1, and Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit wardom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and drink and bow down to their gods. Look at verse 3. And Israel joined himself unto Baal How did they join? Number one, they started committing wardom get their marriages, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. So acceptance and tolerance of sin is to be doing the work of the devil. Look at Acts chapter 16. Another strategy that Satan wants to use here. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. There was this damsel that was following Paul and his companions. And as they went to prayer, verse 16 of Acts chapter 16, and it came to pass as he went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination methods, which brought her masters much gain by such saying. The same followed Paul and us and Christ saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. See, there was nothing erroneous in what she was saying. These men, they are the people of God. That's true. But there was a spirit behind it. On the surface, it appears that she wanted to identify with Paul and Silas and his companion. 
but she was a soothsayer. So that when perhaps they've gone to another city, they will say, you see, you know, we were together with them. We are the same with Paul and Silas. We, are, we belong to the same kingdom. That was why Paul had to cast out that evil spirit. And that's the strategy of the devil. He introduces error. It might on the surface look innocent to infiltrate the church. People, you know, we have had people come to the church. You know, some times ago I was talking to someone. He said, I, I went to this church, you know, a young man. And, you know, he met a lady. The lady said, oh, he was also born again. And eventually they got married. And after some time there was some problem in the marriage. And uh, they went to the pastor. And the lady said, look, I, I want to be out of this marriage. The pastor said, don't you know that, you know, when you're a Christian, you're not supposed to do that? He said, I didn't know that. Does the Bible say that? Does it know? This is somebody in, in the church. So there are people that infiltrate the church. They are not born again. They just want to snatch a brother, snatch a sister. And if you're not careful, they might appear just like this lady here. This man, they are people of God. We are together. But inside them, there's another spirit, the spirit of the devil. May you not fall into the trap of the devil in Jesus' name. Amen. So there is no communion between righteousness and unrighteousness. Look at Matthew chapter 7 in verse 23. It says, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that walk iniquity. You see, when your life is an ongoing, constant, uninterrupted violation of God's word, God's will, and God's law, you are practicing un unrighteousness. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And the Bible says, you know, don't you know that the long suffering of God leadeth you to repentance. You are treasuring up unto yourself wrath against the day of the revelation of the law. You know, sometimes we look at the world. You see, sometimes unbelievers, they live long. And you begin to wonder, why does God allow them to live long? Because God wants them to repent. But it's actually not in their best interest because the longer they live without repenting, when they die, their punishment in hell will actually be greater than somebody who lives short life and dies in sin. Both of them will go to hell, but the one that lived longer was given a greater, longer opportunity to repent. That is why the Bible says you are treasuring up yourself rough. That means we are piling it up. It's like you are coming to this church. There are people coming to this church two years, three years, five years, six years, and they are not born again. If you die in your sin, do you know the, your punishment in hell will be greater than somebody out there who never even had. Never. They will also go to hell. But your own punishment in hell will be greater than somebody who never had the opportunity. You come to a church like this. And you hear the word of God day in, day out, week in, week, and you are not born again. You go to hell, it will be terrible. Yours will not be like that in Jesus' name. Amen. So Christ wants us to be separated. In Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26, verse 18. It says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them who are sanctified by faith that is in me. Look at that progression. Number one, you are turned from darkness to light. You are turned from Satan to God. You receive forgiveness of sins and you are sanctified and you receive that inheritance. You know, anytime I remember the day when that brother came to our house many, many years ago, 
with my younger one, told me the word of God, and I received Christ. You know, it's been many, many years, but anytime I remember the joy that fills my heart. There was a day I was just listening to a song. I just started crying. Because looking at the, 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 the gift of salvation, the gift of knowing Christ, even if I don't get any other thing on earth, it's just enough for me. It's just, it's just amazing. Paul said, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. It's something that you cannot toy with. It's something that is so precious that you just must not afford not to get the forgiveness of your sins. Inheritance among the saints is the joy that except you have it, you cannot describe it. It is only when you have it that you know it. The Lord will give you that joy in Jesus' name. The temple of God with idols. You know, Jesus Christ wants to dwell in us. I don't have time to read, but you can read 2 Kings chapter 21, verses 10 to 12. Manasseh brought idols into the temple of Jerusalem and God punished him severely for it. And that is why the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You know, it says you are the temple of the living God. You cannot afford to defile that temple. God lives inside you. You know, I was listening to some, uh, you know, it was like a talk about sexual harassment in the workplace. And they were saying that, you know, there's a lot of sexual harassment in the workplace. What are people doing? They said, even, even leering, peeping, staring. When you stare at someone in a suggestive sexual way, that's sexual harassment. I was beginning to wonder. So people in the world, they know this is sexual harassment. But you as a believer, in your closet, those things that you watch, you may say, well, they don't, they don't see me. But if the people of the world will count leering, peeping, staring at sexual harassment, and they are working against it, if you have those things, the Bible says, the lost in your heart, you are defiling the temple of God. If those people can take it as sexual harassment, but, you know, you begin to wonder because they, they are ignorant. You know, somebody who, you know, you go to work and then you, 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 you have a dressing that is provocative. I say, I have a freedom to wear whatever I want. I have a freedom to do whatever. And then you say, oh, somebody is sexually harassing me. I begin to wonder. They're confused because they don't have the power to overcome sin. And they will continue to have, it will continue to be in their society because there is no power to say no to sin. But you, as a child of God, where you are sanctified, where Christ purifies you, you don't defile the temple of God. And look at what Jesus Christ said in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, in verse 14. It says, I have given them thy word, and the world had hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I have given them thy word. You know, when you want to keep the word of God, you know, I was, you know, reading some articles now, you know, in many workplaces now, you know, where, you know, you have uniforms. They are phasing out for the for the ladies. They are phasing out skirts because nobody is wearing them. So if you're a lady working in that kind of organization, you have to go and get your own skirt outside because they are phasing out the skirts at place at place of work. 
But why is that happening? If you say you're a child of God, why is this happening? Because God has given you his word. And you want to keep that word. And you must not be ashamed of it. You must not be frustrated by it. You know, when you go to the shops now, it's hard to see a dress for women that is modest. It's becoming difficult, difficult. Why? Because we are not of the world. Jesus Christ said, look at it, look at it here. It says, I have given them thy word, and the world had hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Why should you be ashamed to stand? You might be the only one. Maybe there are hundreds of women in your place of work. Yeah, you're the only one wearing scared. I begin to wonder what's happening. You want to keep the word of God. If people in the world, they are not ashamed. You know, now they're teaching even young, young people. It's a problem in Britain now. Say, a, a boy can say, I don't want to be a boy again. I want to be a girl. And you cannot do anything as a parent. Once they get to a certain age, they can go to the doctor and they can begin to, it's, they say it's freedom. And they're not ashamed. All these abominations are being legalized. And they will say, it's my right. It's my right to be who I am. Nobody can discriminate. So why can't you use your right to follow the word of God? You must be proud of it. Because we are not of the world. We are separated unto God. He says, they are not of the world. Verse 16. Even as I am not of the world, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. So one of the greatest challenges that we face as believers is how can we be in the world and not be of the world? It's going to become more challenging. It's going to become more difficult. You must have the conviction to be able to stand because we are going to be more, more and more isolated. But that is what God wants because he says, I have given them thy word. If you want to keep to the word of God, you will be alone. You will be isolated. But remember, Jesus himself said, I myself, I am not of the world. But it is possible. If God has commanded it, it is possible. What God needs us to do is to realize who we are, realize we are the temple of the living God, and to remain separated. Our relationship in business, in the social circles, in the academic circles, at work, in sport, in entertainment, has to be superficial. Because we cannot be yoked together with the unbelievers. You know, that word yoke comes from Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. Look at it. For you to understand what God is telling us in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 20. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. It says, Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. And an ox is like a little, little horse or donkey with a cow. You know, why can't you put them together to plow a ridge or a farm? Because they have two different natures. You as a child of God, you have a different nature to the child of the devil. Different disposition, different minds, different strength. So if the closest person to you, your heart mate, your soul mate, is an unbeliever. As you are trying to run, he's pulling you back. Just like when you have a horse and a cow together plowing the same thing, as the horse is trying to run, the cow is pulling me back. He said, why do you have to go, you know, Monday, you know, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, you are in church. Why are you doing that? Did you kill Jesus? They're trying to pull you back because you are not equally yoked. That's why the Bible says you must not be unequally yoked. 
So that is what God is saying. We have two different schools of thought. Why are a lot of marriages breaking down? Even Christian marriages is because of this separation, this worldliness that is coming into Christian marriages. You know, people come and your closest confidant is a non-believer. Somebody who has thrown away her husband. Say, oh, just put an intervention order. And then just take him out. And that is the person advising you. And they will tell you, 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 know, you mean he did that? You mean she did that? That is controlling. That is abuse. They will turn your head. Because that is the system of the world. The system of the world is geared towards selfishness. Selfishness in their heart. There is no submission and love. The Bible says, husband, love your wife. Wife, submit to your husband. That is not for the world. The world is, you do your thing, I do my thing. And that is what is breaking a lot of marriages. The Bible says, we are not of the world. Our close confidence cannot be the people or the world. How do we do this practically? Let's look at the context of what Paul was trying to tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. How can we be in the world and not of the world? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 19. He says, what say I then, that the idol is anything, or that, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols in, in, is anything? But I say, on, I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I will not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the lost table and the table of devils. Look at verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. From verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be many gods and lost many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. How be it, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Verse 9, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. What is Paul trying to say here? He's saying that, Look, you are at liberty. But all things are lawful. But all things are not expedient. If you say that you are a believer, and then you say, well, look, all these idols, all these things sacrificed to idols, they don't mean anything. You say, that's true. They are just works of, any man, works of man's hands. But for instance, if you now go to a place where there is a sacrifice to idols. And then you go there. Maybe an unbeliever has invited you. And you go there. Say, yeah, you can, you can honor it. But now there's an, in that same party, there's a young believer there. And you say, well, I don't care. All, all this is offered to idol is nothing. The sacrifice is nothing. And you begin to eat. Say, you will be a stumbling block to that young believer that is there. Because seeing you eat things sacrificed to idols, it means that you are emboldening him to also eat things sacrificed unto idols. 
that is the limit. It says, you are wounding the conscience of such a person. Maybe, you know, there are people who have left the church for whatever reason or the other. I say, oh, I don't like them. You know, I came to the, your church and somebody did something, said something to me, and I, and, uh, I, I stopped coming. And many of them is because they don't want the scrutiny, the scrutiny of the word of God. They don't want a place where they will continue to hear sin will ruin your life. They want to be comfortable. And if you, as a believer, you go to the house of somebody like that and say, oh, your church is like this, oh, this person is there. And you say, oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, that brother is terrible. That's his, oh, oh, yeah. What are they going to say? You are wounding the conscience of the young believers. And that person who has left the church, oh, yeah, they don't like one another. Because you are pleasing him, offending your brother. Just like that person that went into the house of a non-believer that was offered being sacrificed to idols. The question is, do I displease the unbeliever that invited me to this sacrifice? Or do I displease the brother, the young brother that is there, whose conscience I can wound by my actions. You would rather offend the unbeliever rather than your brother. Remember what Jesus Christ said. Look at Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Better to offend the unbeliever. Matthew chapter 18 verse 6. It says, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. What is God telling us here? If your actions, if your behavior, anything that is questionable, that will offend, be a stumbling block to another brother or another sister, don't do it. It may appear innocent. It may appear harmless. Don't do it. And Paul was writing to them. He said, look, even though these idols are nothing, but there are demons behind those idols. And when you are sacrificing to those idols, you are actually sacrificing to those demons. And I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. The same way in the society we, we live today. There's some of those leaders of music. There's some of those YouTube things that are actually demon inspired. Some of those music musicians, they actually are on drugs. And when they're on drugs... Satan enters into them. Demons enter. That's how they get their inspiration. And you listen to those lyrics. You watch those games. You watch those movies. They are demon inspired. They might appear innocent on the surface, but you are opening your mind to demons. That's what Paul was saying. He said, even though you may say, oh, these demons, are, these idols are nothing. I can do whatever. But they represent idols. They represent demons. They are demon inspired. Demons behind them. So as a believer... We must, be set, we must be careful. As godly music will open your heart to the spirit of God. Demonic music will open your heart to demons. There, are, there was this case I had of a child that watched a horror movie. And since he watched that horror movie, he became epileptic. He would have seizures that was uncontrollable. People didn't know. Perhaps while he was watching those, he opened his mind to evil spirits. That is what God is calling us to do. And I pray the Lord will give us the grace to do that in Jesus' name. Lastly, I go to sanctified, holy unto the Lord. Let's look at First Thessalonians. We're going to pray shortly because I want us to spend some time to pray before we pray. Let's look at these passages of Scripture. First Thessalonians, chapter five, verse twenty-three. It says, "And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly." And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus. He said, "I am praying." How do you get sanctified? It's by prayer. I, say, I pray for you 
that your soul, your spirit, and your body will preserve blameless. You cannot get sanctified without prayer. But remember, God wants you separated. Sanctification connotes two things. Separation from pollutions. He say, touch not the unclean thing. What is the unclean thing? It is S-I-N, sin. And the Bible says, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away, have made a shipwreck. You could say, I have faith. Just like I was given the example. I have faith. I can do whatever I like. But does that faith count with a good conscience? Whatever you do, wherever you go, whatever you watch, whatever you put on, and your conscience is not convenient, there's something pricking you as a child of God, you must not ignore it. He said, holding faith, let's look at that before I go on. Let's just look at that very important. First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 1, because this is something that a lot of believers don't take into cognizance in their journey with the Lord. And the Bible says they have made a shipwreck of their faith. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So you can be a giant of faith, but you must also be sure that you have a conscience void of offense, not only towards God, but towards man. Whatever you do, wherever you go, that will be questionable. That will make a brother to second guess you. You know, the Bible says, if you wound the conscience of people like that, God will not hold you guiltless. Have a conscience void of offense towards God and towards man. So how do we get sanctified? By prayer. By faith. Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 9. Acts chapter 15, verse 9. It says, And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. God will purify your heart by faith. Not only that, John chapter 17, John chapter 17, look at verse 15 again. It says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. It's not talking about the evil of danger now, but also the evil of sin, the evil of corruption, the evil of godliness. They are not of the world. That's what it means. As I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy fruit. Thy word is truth. So how do we get sanctified? By the word of God, which is the truth, by faith, and by prayer. Let's rise up to pray. By the word of the Lord, by faith, and by prayer. Paul says, I pray that your body, your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. And you need to pray for yourself now. Number one, are you saved from wrath? The wrath to come. You've been in this church. You were born in this church practically. Are you saved? Are you saved from the wrath to come? Or you are just coming because your parents are coming. You're just coming and listening. But it doesn't make sense to you. Escape for your life. How do you escape? Being justified freely by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When you are justified by the blood of Christ, somebody says it's as if, just as if you have never sinned. God wipes your sins away. It's a clean slate. You begin a new life. Escape for your life. How do you escape? John the Baptist says, Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. Who has warned you to flee from the road to come? Bring forth the fruit of repentance. Repent of your sin. 
genuine repentance. Pray and ask the Lord. You will escape. When your wrath is placed on Christ, you will not suffer the wrath of God anymore. And if you say, oh, well, I'm still living in sin, but God is still blessing me. I'm still passing my exam. I'm still getting this and getting that. Don't you know the goodness of God is to lead you to repentance? That goodness of God is not to encourage you in sin. It's to encourage you to repent. And if you don't, the punishment will be greater. Pray that the Lord will save you from the wrath. Salvation. And are you separate from the world? Are you separated from the world? Or is the world so much in your heart that there is no difference? Pray and ask the Lord. There is no fellowship between righteousness and unrighteousness. There is no concord between Christ and Belial. He said, come out from among them and be ye separate. We're not talking about, you know, moving to another suburb because your neighbors are unbelievers. That's not what we're saying. We're not saying go away from your work because your, past, your, your, your boss and your co-workers, they are unbelievers. That's not what we're saying. We're not saying go and live in a cave. That's not what we're saying. We're saying when you stand on the word of the Lord, you will be hated. You don't want to please the world. It says, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. When you refuse to dress like them, when you refuse to talk like them, when you refuse to do things the way they do it, they will hate you only because you want to stick to the word of God. You need to pray this morning, the Lord give you the grace to stand. If it means standing alone, you will stand alone. If you are the only one, that is against worldliness and sin, you will stand alone. Pray and ask the Lord. Jesus says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. The Lord's grace is sufficient for you. You will not compromise. You will not please the world. If people that are engaged in abominations, they are not ashamed to come out and to flaunt their ways and they are proud of it, how can you be ashamed of standing for the Lord? How will you be? And pray that the Lord will sanctify you wholly, your soul, spirit, and body. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. Your heart is pure, purified by faith, separated unto God, unto the service of the Lord. You are not touching, he say, come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing, unclean thing. Pray that the Lord will preserve you blameless from touching any unclean thing in the name of Jesus. Still in the mood of prayers. We are on the operation table right now. That operation is not done with the physical hands. Lay yourself on the altar right now, like Isaac. Let the Lord do what he does best. Open you up and remove every tear that the enemy has sown into your soul, into your heart. Let him do his work.
Of everything God created, they were male and female. Unto Adam, there was no female. God performed that surgery, put Adam to sleep, and took from his ribs and formed a woman. Let God now open your heart, open your voice, open your lips. Let God do his perfect work. What we have heard this morning cannot go just like we always let it go. I will not let you go until you bless me. Brethren, it is time to lift up our hearts and say, Lord, help me. Everything that is constituting as hindrance, nuisance, unacceptable to God in our lives, we must let it go right now on this altar. Talk to God. Everyone that meets Christ either goes changed or gets worse. It is a decision we have to make. Whether we want him to perform his work that he does best or we want to remain the way we are. Talk to God. If this word has caught your heart this morning, that means something needs to happen. Talk to God. Saved, separated. We are not of the world, even though we are in the world. It is the word of God that distinguishes us. Talk to God this morning. I have given them thy word. Have you received the word this morning? Talk to God. We end by reading Acts chapter 2. I'll read from verse 37. Now when they had this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That is what we need to do now. Talk to God. Lord, help me. If Peter didn't cry unto the Lord while he was sinking in that water, he would have drowned right there in the presence of the Lord. Reach out to heaven and ask for help. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for what you have injected into our bloodstream this morning. Lord, everything that is chaff, that is tear, that the enemy has sown while we were sleeping, Lord, remove them in the mighty name of Jesus. Every hindrance, every encumbrance that is preventing us from worshiping you acceptably, Lord, remove them on this altar this morning in the name of Jesus. This word that has come to us this morning and has pricked our hearts. Lord, we have lifted up our voices and we have cried for help. 
Lord, let the help of heaven come to us in the mighty name of Jesus. Make us holy, Lord. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus. As we continue in the program, go with us. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.